way. Welcome everyone to our latest Next Practices weekly call. Uh, this one we're going to be focusing on flexible and hybrid work as we've done many times on these Thursdays. Um, great to see so many names and faces from these calls over the past several weeks. Hey, I see you there, Russell. Uh, great to see some other folks rejoining and also some new names and faces as well. We always get a good uh, turnout for these calls. Uh, if you're not familiar with I4CP, we are the Institute for Corporate Productivity. We are a human capital research firm that specializes in discovering the people practices that truly drive high performance. And we measure high performance by revenue growth, market share, profitability, and customer satisfaction. And we like to really look for those practices that not all organizations are doing, but that high performance organizations do more than low. Um, the ones that aren't done commonly, we like to call next practices to distinguish them from the more common best practices. Um, we provide our full research and resources out to our I4CP members. So if you're with an I4CP member company and on the call today, special welcome to you. You see here just a small sampling uh, of the logos of just some of our members. Uh, you see a nice wide range of large companies like Amazon and Accenture and Microsoft, as well as some smaller names. Uh, some are household names, some are specialty in various industries. We really cover all industries across our, our wonderful membership. Uh, my name is Tom Stone. I'm a senior research analyst here at I4CP, and today I have the honor of one of my colleagues, Catherine Brecken, also a senior research analyst, joining me as co-host. Good morning, Catherine. Good morning, Tom. I'm excited to be here today. Great to have you with us, and we'll be introducing our special guests and getting the conversation going in just a few minutes. Um, but first, a few more housekeeping items. We do meet every Thursday, so if you're new to this call series, you can come back every Thursday at 11 a.m. Eastern Time, 8 a.m. Pacific. Uh, we rotate the topics. Uh, today, we'll be talking about culture and flexible and hybrid work. Uh, you see upcoming, we'll be talking about talent acquisition. We rotate in learning and development. Uh, HR strategy, total rewards, really all different uh, focus areas of HR. Um, we'll have a special meeting on the 6th. We'll be skipping next week because of our company conference, um, but then we'll have a recap of that conference, which will be a special one uh, on April 6th, and then, and then you'll see we'll get back to some more regular topics in the weeks that follow. A couple of other reminders for everyone. We recently released a major study, Culture, Fitness, Healthy Habits of High Performance Organizations, which my co-host today, Catherine, uh, was a major player along with our CEO, Kevin Oakes, in producing that study. Um, if you haven't seen it, if you're uh, looking to, to get some of the great findings from that, you can go to the URL that's there on the screen. Uh, Zeta has put that URL over in the chat as well. Thank you, Zeta. Um, and also, I'd like to remind you that if you weren't at the February 16th Next Practices Weekly Call, that was when uh, Catherine and, Kat and, and Kevin uh, gave a great rundown of the key findings of that study. All of these calls on these Thursday Next Practice Weeklies are archived on our website, so you can go back and listen to the recordings, uh, and that'll be true going forward as well. Get them on your calendar, uh, and if you happen to need to miss one uh, in any given week, just know that you can watch the recording, and I would especially encourage you to check out that February 16th one on this topic. This is our last reminder for our conference, which is next week. At this point, if you haven't already made your plans to be there in person, uh, I don't assume you will at this late date, but you're more than welcome to. But we also have a virtual option. So at this, at this point, I want to emphasize that um, you can register for the virtual option and still hear the wonderful presentations from all the great speakers we have. You see just a small sampling of them here on the screen. We've got uh, thought leaders, book authors, CHROs, other HR leaders, uh, a really nice spread uh, of speakers and, and, uh, and events at this this conference. To register either for in-person or for the virtual version, just go to i4cp.com forward slash conference. And again, that link has been put in the chat. Uh, one of the things we'll be doing at the conference, uh, just a last note before we get into our guests for today, is announcing uh, our Next Practice Award winners. Um, we have already announced who the finalists are, and you see those logos here on the screen, some great, great companies. Um, these companies are ones that submitted um, uh, you know, abstracts of some next practices, some great work that they've been doing across all different areas of human capital. These were, were reviewed by uh, a committee here at I4CP, and we're getting excited to announce who the award-winning uh, winners are at, at the conference here coming up next week. 
And okay, with that, uh, I think we're ready at this point to bring in our guests. We're delighted to have folks from Getty Images joining us. And I'm going to turn things over to Catherine to both introduce them and then lead the conversation. Thanks, Tom. I appreciate that. Um, so very excited about our guests today. As we all know, our models of work are sort of iterative and continually changing uh, as we emerge from the pandemic. And so we have a very exciting topic as well. We're going to talk about revolutionizing hybrid work by focusing on culture with Nicole Underwood, VP of HR Business Partners and Operation at Get Operations at Getty Images, and um, Marie Potter, Senior Director of Culture and Development at Getty Images. Welcome. Hi, thanks so much for having us here. Um, I'm going to go ahead and share my screen. But while I do that, Nicole, do you want to give a little bit more of an introduction about yourself um, and your team and where you're located? Absolutely. Hello, everybody. I'm Nicole Underwood. I am located in the Seattle, Washington area. Currently a hybrid employee for our organization, mostly working from home. We'll get into that later. Um, my team, as Catherine mentioned, is uh, the HR business partners and HR operations team of about 20 supporting our organization. I've been with Getty for just over three years. So I started in January of 2020, which was an interesting time to start, um, as you can imagine. So, and I've had the pleasure of working with Marie all that time. So Marie, do you want to give yourself a little bit of an introduction? Brag yes, about that sunshine, sunshine? I know, I, I dropped it in the chat for you all just to share uh, what's pretty amazing about the fact that I live in Arizona. A whole bunch of you are going to come to Arizona next week for the I4CP Next Practices Now conference. And I checked the weather before this call and it's nice and in the 70 degrees. So if you're if you're sick of that snow in Maine, come on down. We'll we'll hang out with you. Not necessarily poolside. We'll be in an air conditioned conference room, but I mean you'll get a step outside and have lunch and 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 cocktails together. So um, really great to be here. As Nicole said, hybrid worker. I used to live in Seattle. Pandemic hit. Um, this opportunity for hybrid work came up, um, and I had a family need, and that family need was able to be met, and we moved down here, and I was able to retain my job. So I'm a huge fan of how we revolutionize hybrid work and the important uh, the important impact it has on our culture. Um, we're going to share with you some things around Getty Images, our research, our images, our videos. Um, we're going to make sure that we give you an opportunity to um, talk with us about what we're doing here in our culture. Um, and before I get started, I, I just realized culture and development, you might be wondering what that is. Uh, so my team focuses on learning and development, diversity and inclusion, and people analytics. And so again, uh, great partners with our HRBPs and our HR operations uh, team that Nicole runs. Um, so I think with that, let's get going. One quick thing, Marie, before you jump yeah. in, if you notice, Marie and I have our backgrounds with <laughs> some of our amazing imagery that we have here at Getty Images, so you might see them change throughout, so take a look at the images as well. Awesome. Um, and the other thing, Nicole and I are both at home right now, so I think you're also not seeing our <laughs> our rooms. Um, and uh, let's talk a bit about more about Getty Images and our global HR team. So at Getty Images, we believe in the power of imagery. You know, that perfect image or video, as you can see here, can make you think or feel or act. And it drives home your message, elevates your brand, fits your budget. We help businesses of all types and sizes connect and engage with their audience in an increasingly digital and visual world, just like we're in right now. Um, Getty Images, I stock Unsplash. So we have three brands and they're brought together by one mission, which is move the world. You may recognize us by any of these names. You may be a customer or, or prefer to go to any of these sites. You know, we serve over a million customers around the globe and we're the first place people turn to to discover and purchase and share powerful imagery and video from the world's best photographers and videographers. The Visual storytelling that we get to do is probably one of my most favorite parts of working here. We're the world's foremost visual experts in capturing and creating and preserving content to elevate visual communications everywhere. We identify cultural shifts, spearhead trends, and power the creative economy, and we fuel visual storytelling worldwide. We have amazing depth and breadth in our coverage. We cover news, sports, entertainment events. We have exclusive conceptual creative imagery. We pioneer custom content. We serve as a distribution partner for hundreds of brands and organizations, including some of yours. Uh, so thank you for being our customers. And we maintain one of the world's largest and best privately owned photographic archives. So we have photos dating back to the beginning of photography. 
Um, something I'm going to mention a little bit later, and we'll use some data from it to talk about hybrid work, is our visual GPS program. This is where we build upon expertise from research and reporting on real customer-driven insights that help our customers navigate kind of this crowded visual landscape um, and help them identify where they can have true impact. Visual GPS shows what consumers care about. Um, and how they can tap into it. So when you go to the Getty Images website, if you look at the upper left-hand corner, you can see visual GPS insights, and that's a really interactive tool where you can actually search trend data. Um, and again, we'll share some more examples of that um, as we go throughout our presentation today. So it's one thing to talk about what we do as a business. It's all very important and our customers drive um, our mission, but it's also important to talk about our values because we're here today to talk about culture and how that revolutionizes hybrid work. So at Getty Images, we have a goal to be one of the best places to work globally. We instill a passion for our Move the World mission by showcasing care for our 1700 colleagues spread out across the world. So our values, our foundation, rests with our leadership principles, which is what you can see here. These are summed up as how we come together to do our work. And these principles inform and are woven into everything we do, including that decision to take on a hybrid working world environment. They drive us to be customer focused, to be inclusive, to be supportive, and to always strive for growth. Um, they apply to everyone. So it's not just people managers. Some may say leadership at principles and think, well, that's only your people managers, right? No, it's every single employee because we can all be leaders in how we do our work. Um, you know, we often talk about our Getty Images content, and I hope you see the example today. Um, it's inclusive, it's authentic, it's representative, it's differentiated. You know, we can attribute these same things to our company culture. You know, we foster spaces for our employees to make an impact, to thrive, to learn, to engage. You know, and in turn, our culture supports us in attracting and growing and retaining some pretty awesome talent. We'll go and unpack all of that today as we talk more specifically with solid examples of what we do. I love how your values really connect to the brand and carry that out. That's an amazing overview that you've done very in a very brief amount of time. Um, Nicole, why don't you tell us a little bit about HR and the structure within Getty? Absolutely. Um, thank you, Catherine. So now that you've heard about what we do and what we value at Getty, let's talk more about our global HR team and how we fit into the overall picture. So our mission is people first. That is, um, those are the words that we use. That is where we start with as, um, as an HR organization. And I do want to read the words on the site because words matter to really emphasize the mission that we have crafted on helping support our employees. Our employees drive the success of Getty Images through our shared energy, passion, innovation, and leadership. How our employees work, feel, belong, and develop determines their engagement and by extension, the company's success. Our global human resources team is uniquely positioned to influence our employees' engagement directly and in partnership with leaders. In all we do, we commit to putting our people first. So with that being said, <clears throat> we have a significant global employee presence. And while our total employee population is not large, we're approximately 1,700 employees, we do employ another several hundred contributors and contractors who support our business. Plus, we connect with over 100,000 freelance content contribu contributors around the world. So it gives our small team a very mighty presence, as you can imagine. And with that, as you can see on the slide, we have 17 functions. We have 60 employees, 60 HR employees supporting 17 functions across 33 countries. So even having one employee in a country requires the full stand-up of our employee support from payroll to benefits to employment law on the tactical side, and then the integration of culture and customs on our culture side. With our 60 HR professionals in our organization, while it might feel large given 1,700, it is critically important so we can support all these functions across our globe. Breaking it down a little bit further to tell you about the different parts of our team, starting with our HR business partners, my team, these are the individuals working with our business leaders to understand their business, to best ensure they're using their people and leadership to achieve their greatest outcome. I call my team a tool in the tool belt for their leadership. Their leadership has to, our leadership has to think about multiple things through their day, people being one, and we're that tool and that resource that they can lead on. And we really help drive performance and organizational conversations, helping our leaders think about succession planning, talent development, and then also at times handling some of our more sensitive employee relations topics. Moving to our next bucket, 
HR operations. This is actually a new function for us. When I came in three years ago, we had a lot of our tactical administrative work spread across the team. And as we've become much more focused and prioritized, we've started to streamline all of that work into this team. And they're really becoming responsible for our data inputs, our employee data, making sure we have the right resources and tools for our internal HR team to better support our external employee population and providing a consistent experience for all of our employees. We have also added an HR project manager to this team who is very instrumental in driving forward and owning our biggest initiatives and projects and our most complex and sensitive pieces of that, which has helped us really prioritize and focus our work. To our next team, total rewards. So it combines the four organizations listed here. This is bringing really deep expertise to these fields into our organization and ensuring we have a global perspective while addressing also the local needs of our employees. We have a global benefits team. They're thinking about our benefits globally and then across 33 countries, because we offer benefits in all of them, how are we supporting those local needs? Culture and development, which Marie did a great job summarizing for us and really supporting that growth and learning of our employees and managers. Again, looking at the global aspects, partnering very closely to our commitment to DNI and weaving that throughout their work and our work. And then we partner very closely with HRBPs on help we support down through the functional groups with our people insights analysts as well on this team, telling us the story of our people through our data. Again, deep experts sit in this team, similar to our total awards, and they're bringing to life the adult learning necessary for our employees to thrive and grow. And then we'll end it where it starts. We have our talent acquisition team who globally recruits and hires over 300 employees every year. They are looking for such specialized individual talent in our global workforce. We have some very unique needs as an organization, and they do a great job finding us amazing talent. So we're quite a lean HR team that requires a constant fostering of relationships across the business and within HR. And when I say within, it's because we support each other. We step in when colleagues are overwhelmed. We help reprioritize work. We get very focused as a leadership team. We're constantly evaluating what we're working on and is it the top priority. And then we really work to break down traditional HR barriers and focus that we are one global HR team. And we encourage our employees to bring solutions and to partner, focus on good judgment, data-driven decision-making to make sure that we're driving the right rigor and discipline. Thanks, Nicole. That's such a good overview of our team because it's a it's a small team, but a mighty team and a really connected team. Um, and Nicole's my work wife. I'm just we're gonna we own that. We talk about the time. We have got to be best partners to each other, advocates, champions, challengers, and that's how our leadership team works, and that's how we expect our global HR team to work. Hey, Nicole, there was a good question here around, can you explain the difference between HR systems under total rewards and your new HR ops team? Absolutely. So our HR systems team owns the systems where we do all of our HR um, data and work. So they are responsible for Lever, which is our um, ATS, and then Workday, which is our HRIS. And they own the the infrastructure around all of that, making sure it's stood up, we can use it, making the changes as necessary, making sure they it talk to each other. Well, our operations team is owning all of the information that goes into those systems. So when we have an employee change, HR operations, making sure that employee change happens within the system. And then if there things are happening as our HR operations team is going through data changes or looking at the information, if something is not working in the system, then they work with HRS to say, can we make this change? How can we make sure that we're supporting and making the tools better? Hopefully that's helpful. And the people analytics side under culture and development, I know it's a little weird to have your analytics with your L&D and your DNI. Um, it just the way it ended up falling at the time you're we hiring. Um, I have a background working with uh, information science and data. And so it was a natural fit, but really they're looking at helping us tell the story of our people and culture and development. We're storytellers. We're, we're producing our annual DNI report. We're doing the engagement survey work. And so um, I like to say there's a trifecta and a power when you have HR ops, uh, HR systems and analytics kind of working in different realms of HR, but coming together to be this like power dynamic and making sure that we're really looking at things as again, one global HR. Um, that's a little bit about our HR team. 
I'm always fascinated by how global organizations such as Getty um, yeah. create that one HR feel, you know, with, you know, operations in so many different countries. It's fascinating to hear how you guys are structured and, and how that's working. Um, let's dig into culture, though. If, um, if we could go back to the, to the values that you talked about earlier, um, our research at I4CP has shown that clearly communicating organizational values and having leaders consistently demonstrate those values are huge drivers of culture fitness and healthier cultures. Uh, can you tell us more about your values and how they align to Getty's culture? Yeah, absolutely. Thank you, Catherine. The success of our hybrid working world really does rest in our culture. Uh, we've taken a lot of time at Getty Images to make sure we're clearly defining what that looks like. And we've stood up three sets of principles that round out our culture. Leadership principles, which Marie mentioned earlier, we'll share a little bit more, our flexible work principles, and then our operating principles. So when we jump into more of the detail, on the left-hand side, and as I mentioned, Marie shared, our values start with our leadership principles. This is our first culture identifying area, and they guide us on how we come together, how we do we work, how we do our work. There's what we do every day, and then there's how we do it. In fact, they're so critical, they are 50% of how we evaluate our employees throughout the year. These were established in 2002, and they've been refined since then. We do update them to re reflect important shifts we've added, we've changed, and we continue to remain agile and open to growth. Our next culture defining area are our work are our flexible work principles. And these are the parameters we've created for balancing that personal need with the company need. What's interesting is these were established in 2019, not knowing what was coming. And having these established before the global pandemic um, were, it was great because they were such a strong foundation then to lean on and guide us through when the pandemic hit and we had to see some shifts in our business in the way that we work. And then rounding out our culture and just actually introduced this year are our operating principles. And this is the articulation of the preferences that guide our decision-making, staffing, and resource allocation. And these, all these three bring together, these are, these are guides. We use these as guides as our interaction through our interactions, our contributions, and our decision-making. They're not, they're not hard and fast rules, but they also aren't excuses after the fact. They're what steers our ship in the right direction. And if anytime we are starting a journey, we're thinking about a new project, we're thinking about a new business, we start with these as our foundation. And we'll continue as we chat, Maria and I, referencing these principles, you'll hear the language, and hopefully it becomes clear and you can see how we apply them as the hallmarks of our culture in our hybrid working world. I love that you've got those flexible work principles and that they started in 2019. That really, I'm sure helped. Oh, we were very glad that they were, we were very glad. <laughs> come 2020. <laughs> well, so let's talk about hybrid work. Our research at I4CP has found flexibility in work arrangements is the top element high performance organizations are emphasizing as part of their EVP. And also that the more flexibility employers provide in terms of where and when the work gets done, the better their retention of employees. What is Getty's take on hybrid work? What does it look like? I, one of the things that I really appreciate about our partnership with you all with I4CP is we also let data inform us. We have good judgment, good hunches, but a hunch is a hunch until you can have the evidence behind it. So we're going to actually talk about, I mentioned earlier, our vis latest visual GPS research, because that look at how consumers are thinking and feeling about the future of work and how priorities may have shifted since the pandemic, um, that's important for us to understand. So we combined this with our internal search data for work and business related images and videos. Um, and there are several trends to be aware of. So I'll go over some of those right now. Um, and actually, before I do that, I'm going to show you a video because uh, I like showcasing, again, our images, our videos, and then also our, our staff and what we're doing because research is a big part of it. So I'm going to press play. You should be able to hear the sound. If not, someone wave their hand, uh, and then I'll share with you some of those trends. Oh, that was me. There you go. <laughs> the future of work is about elevating life, not minimizing work. 
We have all seen how the world has shifted since the pandemic and office-based businesses especially have been wrestling with the need to cater for employees whose priorities have changed and are now approaching work differently. We saw the shift in the great resignation of 2022 and it's still evident in the high number of open job positions available. In our day jobs, we are also aware of how the businesses we work with are attempting to show how they have evolved to meet the current needs of employees and also showing their own customers that they are forward thinking and not stuck in the pre-COVID past. Our latest visual GPS research looks at how consumers are thinking and feeling about the future of work and how priorities may have shifted since the pandemic. Combined with our internal search data for work and business related images and videos, our findings point to several trends you should be aware of. Some may seem obvious, others new and inspiring. Are you speaking the new visual language? Let's find out. All right, let's find out indeed. Uh, and this is where I'll share with you some of those data pieces. You know what's interesting too to me is that when you see a video like that and you see the images that come up around work and you see people at home or with their kids in the kitchen um, or in an office space, it, it's so different than how we would define work and how we would visualize work four years ago. Um, some of you have had your cameras on and off throughout this call. I've been watching. Some of you, I can tell you're at home. Some of you, I can tell you're in office. And Jill, I hope you're driving safely because I think you're in your car at one point. Um, so it's really interesting. We're all coming. We're all professionals. We're all working. Um, we're here doing our jobs, but we're in completely different locations around the globe and around our homes. Some of you just shared your cameras. Thanks. You're, you're demonstrating in real life what we're seeing our customers experience. Um, what are these trends? So work, guess what? Still important, but the focus on quality of life has grown. And so since the pandemic, almost three quarters, about 75% of employees agree that achieving a better balance between work and their personal life has become more of a priority. This is particularly uh, the case for younger generations as they join the workforce. And older generations are also trying to find ways to create work-life balance that they've never experienced before um, or even thought could exist. Uh, this has been reflected in a new type of visualization of work as we just saw through those images. And again, as we look around the room, we see here today. Another one, uh, companies need to show they care with flexible work arrangement arrangements and new norms for engagement. So remember that great resignation, that headline, you know, it hit. And in response, there's been twice as much interest in brands by visualizing employee appreciation. So there's actually been a 45% increase in global searches linked to employee appreciation just last year in 2022. So that goes beyond more than showing that you allow individuals to cho like choose what type of working situations work best for them. You also have to show that business leaders care. They're more empathetic. Um, they understand the workforce and they're able to communicate in a more personal and emotional way. So this has influenced that visual language in that there's more care being demonstrated in business transactions. Another thing that we've learned is creating a sense of belonging is key as mental health has grown in importance. Companies have a part to play. So while there's still a feeling of optimism about the future of work, those who were indoctrinated into what we call the like old COVID pre pre COVID ways of work, they're you know some of them miss it. They're trying to maintain that feeling of belonging that was more tangible when you just physically were situated together. You know, even though most workers prefer having a choice, sixty six percent agree that they do miss social interaction and connections when they're not working at the office. And so, search trends show a rise in content related to networking team building, events, conferences, uh, much like I4CP has the conference next week, right? People will gather, then they'll disperse again. Um, importantly, companies are looking to promote in-work interaction um, and, and employees are looking for companies to promote or create the opportunities for those social interactions. Um, at Getty Images, we just had a global talent show um, so that people could connect on a more personal level. Video submissions, it was ridiculous. I was ridiculous. I have no talent. Other people were ridiculously talented, but it just demonstrates that connection and collaboration, they're still key to what we do. You know, as for mental health as well, um, I sit on the uh, employee well-being exchange with Carrie and a number of other folks who, who join us on a regular basis. Um, and mental health is 
becoming an increasingly more important life focus uh, and worry, and just that overall balance of well being. 92% um, of people think it's equally important to take care of themselves emotionally as well as physically. So 68% report that they take steps to improve their health and well being every day, and 46% are prioritizing their mental health now more than ever. So our companies have a part to play in all of this by our programming, by our decisions, by how we talk about these things. Um, and one more or two more facts, 60% globally think that companies should focus on well-being and 68% agree that companies should support mental health and diversity, equity, and inclusion. So the data tells us the truth. The data tells us the facts. Um, and again, if, you, if you're at all in a position where you're trying to talk with your leadership as HR leaders, and you're trying to talk with folks in your company and trying to get them to understand what is this navigating workforce, the revolutionizing of hybrid work, what are the employee needs, like go to I4CP and look at the data there. That's what we do. And go to things like visual GPS insights at Getty Images and look at the data there and use that to help shape that story and that argument um, or help convince your leadership, your teams, your peers around where the future of work is going. It's going gonna, it's gonna to help you make a more um, compelling statement around how you'll prioritize your employees' well-being and care and still get really good work done. Uh, Marie, if I could just jump in real quick, um, we had a it. request from from Sheila uh, to reiterate what the mental health stat was that you that you just shared. Awesome! I think Nicole, did you just pop that in the you just chat? pop that in the chat? Thank you. I yeah. tried, but it came up tiny, so I'm gonna do a little bit better. So just give me one second. Uh, oh, no, oh, I well, see that. No, oh, did it come uh, up? I, I, it's yeah, like teeny we, we see it. Okay, we, perfect. I, I think we see it. Um, and also, oh, I just wanted I'll to send you the link to our... this research. Yeah. I'll do that too. Thank you. Um, You're welcome. Wanted to reiterate uh, what our colleague Carrie Bevis here at I4CP said in the chat as well, uh, which is to thank you for being to leaning into <laughs> I4CP. You uh, people on the call might not know, but you are one of our member leads for our Employee Wellbeing Exchange. Um, those that aren't I4CP members wouldn't know this, but we have several exchanges, over a half dozen on different topics, um, and they're all led by member representatives from our member organizations. And Marie, you are one of those member leaders. So thank you for that. Ah, uh, you're welcome. It's love. And you know, Carrie's very convincing. It was a year ago at the I4CP Next Practices Now conference. We were sitting at lunch and she's like, so you know, <laughs> we got an opening here. <laughs> Come hang out with us. And that's all it took. So it's fun to engage with you all and to talk. Well, I love I love that stat that the majority of the employees think that companies should focus on well-being. How does that in, you know incorporate into the culture that you've built? And you know, maybe you could start too from the beginning, a little bit before the, the how was the policy created? What's the roadmap yeah. to the hybrid plan that you have now? Perfect. I'm gonna actually That's stop it. sharing my screen now and we'll just let's talk. Yeah, let's chat. Um, it, it, it's a really great question, Catherine. And so, it, it, as I mentioned, um, the conversation had started in 2019, and I, I joined in January of 2020. So when I joined, I thought, oh, this is the norm. This is what we do, flexible work principles. What I quickly found out was it was new. Um, it was a new thinking. Our leaders really had to stretch to think through <laughs> how people work. We were very office-focused you're in the office, you're working, and we'd introduce like, let's be flexible to our employees. Um, and then, so introduced in 2019, and then in March of 2020, as we all know, global pandemic. And it really, I mean, it escalated our flexible work principle. Like, you know, when you like fast forward and you like do two times and four times and eight times, it was like 32 times, right? We went from, well, we think we could let people maybe work from home one day a week to everyone's home now we're all working from home, right? In, in a matter of days. And so luckily, because we had this, fortunately, I shouldn't say luckily, fortunately, because we had this, we were really able to, to lean on those principles that we shared earlier. So we leaned on our leadership principles, right? We really thought about what our leadership principles, we never changed them. We used our language. We stood them up when we were feeling stress in times, even at open forums, our CEO would bring these up. Let's talk about how we're working together. Um, and then we really leaned on our flexible work principles, and they helped us clarify our global guidelines to optimize work, culture, collaboration. And as we were moving into COVID, through COVID, and then even into opening our offices, which we didn't finalize opening all of our offices until the, almost the end of 2021, because again, multiple countries, different requirements. 
um, we really use those to make those decisions. And then in May of 2021, and I uh, received a question, we did make some updates. So again, we are constantly monitoring and thinking about what's happening in the world. And then how are we representing and where do we need to change? And so we did moderate, we did modify these and we removed some of our languages that were referring to office in the principle. So for example, we said things like, we believe the best way to build trust, collaboration, and freedom of ideation is when colleagues are together in the office to create. And we switch that to when colleagues commune to create. So get, again, reinforcing through our language that we didn't expect you to be in offices mm -hmm. and this is how we wanted us to work together. Um, and it was pretty clear early on in the pandemic that our office culture wasn't going to be the same. And so we, uh, our, G, our global leadership team quickly worked to put together a group of leaders who came together and really started solving for and thinking about our future of work. We thought we, you know, as we came together as one of the leaders on this project, we put trust, radical transparency, communication at the front, and it really led us to build some great things such as an information hub to ensure communication was findable, that we were communing consistently and constantly about where to find information and it wasn't just lost in email or Slack and really getting open and transparent with our employees to understand what they wanted using surveys and open forums and continuing to observe, hear the feedback, look what was happening across the industry, look at I4CP data and then understanding our internal impact. Something and you guys have done a lot of listening oh. about how what employees need. How is it, you know, are, are what's the temp check? Are, how are employees feeling about this today? I well, I our temp check is our employees feel pretty good. We can talk about where we landed with our hybrid working, but the feedback we get is our employees feel pretty supported. Um when we first went into hybrid. I, hold on one second. Maria, I'm sorry. You want to say something and then I just really oh, kept talking over you. You're fine. I was just going to say Tom earlier mentioned, you know, you guys said these are principles, not policies. Absolutely. And Nicole just through that demonstration showed that when you have something that's a principle, it's a guide, it's a steer. Mm -hmm. Policies are way harder to, uh, and rules are way harder to be flexible with. And so if you are looking at your language and your vocabulary around things, we recommend things like principles, guidelines, frameworks, policies, guardrails. Rules, guardrails, policies and rules feel like the the HR days of old and we have to be more nimble than that. And Nicole, you did a you just said some great examples about how we're doing that. But please keep going. How's it going today? Keep us honest. Um so what's interesting is we actually we did a survey uh, about six months into the pandemic and we said to our employees like tell us what do you want when we we are hopeful at that point in time, we would be coming back to a more normalized world. When we do, what do you want? And our employees told us, we like working from home. And by the way, our company, we had an amazing year in 2020. Like our employees went home, we focused, we had an amazing year. We proved as an organization that we could work flexibly, we could work hybridly, we could work from home. And so the majority of our employees said, let us keep that flexibility and hybrid. So as of today, the way our workforce is currently divided up is we have four categorizations that our employees sit in. So 25% of our employees sit in remote. Remote means they don't, they don't have access to and they do not go into an office. They work from home. We then have 56% approximately of our employees that sit in what we call hybrid less than 50%. So these are our employees who are working mostly from home. They have access to an office. They might go in, but it's probably less than two days a week. We have 15% of our population that sit in hybrid more than 50%. So they work from home, but more often than not from the office. And actually only 3% of our employees have opted to come into the office uh, full time. Now, keep in mind, we create space for feedback. We take on board what our employees want, and we also take on board what our business needs are, right? So in some cases, roles have to be remote. When you're a photographer and you travel 200 days of a year because you are out taking pictures of sporting events such as behind me here, being tied to an office isn't going to be a reality. Also, if you're a facilities person helping run one of our offices, we need you there. So we do take those into consideration, but we also recognize that we have 1,700 employees who have 1,700 different realities and expectations. We can't, we can't meet all of them, but understanding what it is they need and want, and then here's what we can do, and then be very clear about why or why not we can't do that. And then continuing to emphasize on our principles and where they are. And we consistently 
are strategizing and planning. So that functional group that I told you about that we brought together, the future of work group, we that group is actually still running today. And let me tell you, we, we made sure it was all encompassing. We brought together HR business partners, benefits people, compensation people, payroll people, finance people, legal people, facilities people, and technology people, all the pieces that are critical into helping understand all the pieces that support our employees in this hybrid world. And then as we were making and defining solutions, we were consistently mapping back to our principles. One thing that came out of this group, and Marie's team was very instrumental in helping set this up as well, was the flexible work SharePoint site. So we have a SharePoint site we have created as our communication hub. It has all the information about the, those different categories I shared, the perks of those, how it works, talking to your employees. Since we launched it in 2021, keep in mind we have 1,700 employees, we have had over 70,000 views of that page. So it is truly a critical communication piece to our employees and making sure that they have the information that they need. And it provides guidance, like I said, some of the things that it says, it also talks about how you book workspace when you are coming into the office, how you submit expenses for you know where whichever um, hybrid working environment you're, you're sitting in. Mm -hmm. And the perks of this get deep. So for each of those categories, we have certain, you know, you can submit certain monthly fees, you can have certain setup fees that are tied to it, transportation subsidies in office. And we've gotten very clear, if you sit in this category, here are your benefits. You sit here, here are your benefits. And then the employees get to have those conversations with their leaders. And it's also led to other business decisions. We've closed facilities, we've reduced our sizes in some of our locations, and we continue to keep the HRBPs and the functional leaders and the people managers talking and getting that feedback brought in so we can make those changes. Hopefully you, I answered your question, Catherine. I had a lot yeah, of Yeah, no, absolutely. <laughs> absolutely. There's a lot of great pieces to this, you know, flexible work model that you have here. And um, I always like to flip the question and say, so, so what do you not do? Like, what are the explicit things you shouldn't do um, if you're trying to revolutionize hybrid work? That's a, that's a great question, Catherine. Um, I feel like we do so much. Um, what do we not do? Well, I think again, we always start with our operating principles and our we we allow, we have open forms, monthly open forms in each of our regions of the globe. Employees pop in, Craig, our CEO is there, our GLT is there, and employees can ask any question and we'll answer, we'll respond. And if we don't have an answer, we will circle back. Um, but, you know, we are very clear and very focused on what we're trying to achieve and where we're trying to go. And if we can't accommodate something, then we very clearly will share it in public forums back to our employees. So I want to, I'll, I'll give you an example. Um, when we started in the, when 2020 happened, we've had a massive reorg. We had brought hubs of people together in different parts of the world. And so we said, hey, people lived all over. We're relocating you to certain areas. COVID hits, everyone goes home. People are living in cities or countries even where they were not from. And um, they said, I want to go home. I want to go home. I want to be with my people until this is over. Well, that introduces tax issues and employee, you know, all sorts of things. So during COVID, we were very flexible because we, we were very aware of the mental health. But after as things started to normalize again, we asked employees kept asking, well, we just want to be able to work anywhere. Can't we work anywhere? Other companies let people work anywhere. And the reality is after doing our own research, we can't allow people to work anywhere all the time, right? Mm -hmm. So we came up with a solution and we've put in short a short-term relocation um, option for certain employees, if it's available, that they can consider and talk with their manager about. So again, very clearly, we can't let you work anywhere, but we have this option that we can provide, right? And here's the reasons why. And we articulated all of those reasons. So I think that's a good example of what we didn't do. Yeah, no, definitely. Um, and we got a couple of questions here in the chat related to the listening strategy. I want to say we have... Mm -hmm. um, uh, um, Cecilia asked, how do you collect feedback from employees? And, um, you know, are those forums 100% unscripted? They are 100% unscripted. So we have a quarterly company all hands meeting that is scripted. Well, let's be very clear. That one is fully scripted. That is recognition, business updates, all sorts of good stuff. These, these monthly open forums are 100% unscripted. And when we started in COVID, they were actually weekly. 
So every single week in all three parts of the world, our CEO and the GLT got on a call and just said, talk to us, tell us what's going on, give us your feedback, let's be here for each other. And then what we found is, eh, you know, people were quiet, but slowly they've warmed up and it has become a conversation. And we, in our mayor region is our largest region, we will have 500 people on that call. And it's just a chat, right, Mary? Like it's very casual chat. People ask- Sometimes it's about sports. Sometimes, right. Sometimes it's, it's about, about sports. you know, the economy, whatever. <laughs> Right. Sometimes people ask hard questions like, I want to relocate. Why won't you let me? Okay, let's talk about that. Another topic that's come up recently in the news, four-day work weeks. Well, a lot of companies are talking about going to a permanent four-day work week. This has been a topic. Our employees feel passionate about this. Um, and again, it's one of those where we said, okay, let's talk about it. What does a four-day work week look like? Can our business model do it? And the reality is, as you can see behind me and behind Marie, things are happening across the world 24-7. Can we say we only work four days a week? The reality is no, we cannot. Now, so we are not going to be a four day work week company, but that mm -hmm. doesn't mean there aren't situations where employees may need that, where we're not going to look at and consider and then potentially accommodate. So if you need it, talk with your manager, mm -hmm. but as a global poll or as a global guideline or poll, no, that's not something we're going to do. And the thing is you really have to look at, just like Nicole said, oh. what is your company doing? Who are your customers? What are your customers' needs? Oh. And where's your staff at? So I know that we are unique, right? 1,700 people. We also, we have a lot of people in office, right? So working from home makes sense for me, for Nicole. We also have event photographers who are walking the red carpet or like the pictures behind me, they're covering news events. Yesterday, I just watched a content hour about the war in Ukraine and Chris McGrath, one of our photographers being out there for months on end, you know, walking along active war happening around him. And he's one of our employees. And so we have to think about, um, where we are in our customers. And I know many of you, some of you are retail, right? You have off, you have um, um, uh, stores to be open seven days a week. You have people coming in out. What's fair between corporate, right? And retail side. There's all those conversations. And Nicole being in Seattle and some of you are in Seattle. Um, I, I used to be in Seattle. We've listened to what Amazon was doing and Starbucks was doing and Google was doing. They had different problems and different things to think about than what we do at Getty Images. So you really have to define and triangulate and think about what your organization can do and is willing to do. And fair does not always mean treating everyone equally. You may have to do layered approaches based on your, um, your company and, and the needs, again, of your customers and where your employees are. Um, but the thoughtfulness that you put in there is really important. And that's where HR, I think, leads the way. Yeah, the, the needs of the customers is big. Also, as you're as you're suggesting, the the different roles in the organization. I mean, there's a lot of talk these days about some companies entirely moving to to four day work weeks. Sometimes it's only for certain roles. In some ways, it's not a new thing. A lot of people in retail manufacturing, um, their employees have had those kind of shifts. And then famously, nurses and and hospitals often have three three day a week shifts that are 12 hours each um, just for consistency of care mm -hmm. for patients. And th those folks get four days off, but they've got those three relatively long days uh, to make up for that. So, um, in, in, you know, it, it, again, it has to, but other people in the hospitals are working the standard five days a week, eight hours a day. Yeah. And I think yeah, this but, is where being very clear and like centered around these three buckets of these principles, right? Because we, when we go back to an employees, we're not saying no. We're saying, like, we want you to understand why we've made this decision and we've either come up with something that meets in between or we're not able to do it and we can lean on this. They might not like the answer, but they, at least they understand it and they have a foundation to understand how we've made those decisions. Mm -hmm. I, first of all, I, I love the fact that your employees feel safe and they can speak their mind and what they're passionate about. I think that's a real testament to a strong culture. Um, but we've talked about sort of the intentionality and how, um, you know, how prescriptive HR needs to be in some circumstances. And on that note, how do you get intentional about connectivity? So when you have employees together, you know, making sure they're not just on Zoom meetings um, when they go to the office, what do you do for that? That's awesome. Um, Tom, did you want to share that slide that we had uh, worked on? Because um, we actually have a visual that might help you understand a little bit about how we get intentional with connectivity. Um, for very first thing, 
I feel like a broken record, but I think you'll understand why um, we define what we're talking about. Uh, we learned this a while ago when we talked initially around diversity and inclusion back in 2017 um, at, at Getty Images there. People have different definitions of diversity. People have different definitions of inclusion. People have different definitions of, of belonging and well-being. And guess what? People have different definitions of connectivity and different expectations. So a really rigorous exercise we put forth was to define what we mean by employee connectivity. That's what you see in purple on the left. I'll, I'll read it to you really quick. Uh, we're committed to a culture of connectivity where employees feel connected to and contribute to our shared mission and goals, right? We start big, who are we as a company? And are we connected to that? Then connectivity means a basis and network to access the right person at the right time to share and give knowledge, build understanding, further inclusion and solve problems to improve business outcomes and the employee experience. That's about how we work and about how we play together, right? All of that. And we are committed to a culture of connectivity independent of employees' physical working election and location. We state that, we, we own that, and we stand by that. Um, what you see there from the icons is just a sampling of, if you think about the employee life cycle, how we take that definition of employee connectivity. Um, and Nicole used this word earlier to talk about how we weave DNI. We weave connectivity as well throughout all that we do. It's not a standalone thing. While we may focus on it at times with very strategic um, activities or ideas, we really make sure that at onboarding, Employees understand how do you get connected? Um, why is connectivity important to your role at Getty Images, whether you're in office um, a couple of days a week, once a month or not at all? We talk about those things. We have a resource pages available for that as well. We use um, Slack at Getty Images. And so there's an app called Donut, that's what it's called, D-O-N-U-T, Donut, look it up. Um, and it does random pairings of people and you can do it across functions. So you could do across the whole company. You can pair leaders with employees. You can pair uh, within HR, different people from HR. You can pair managers and it could be pairings or trios or quads. You can do a lot of, I'm not here to sell Donut on you, by the way, but it's really cool because it's a tool that, um, does a lot of that work for you. It's not a high cost. And it basically has you randomly reaching out to people once a month and, set, and doing 30 minutes of a conversation to say hi. Um, my favorite is when, actually, I have two favorites. One is when you meet someone you've never talked to before one-on-one. -on -one. That's really cool. And the other when it's kind of like an old friend, you haven't, you're not doing any work projects together. You haven't talked for a while. And then the donut gods have paired you up to have a 30 minute conversation later this week. Um, so it's a lot of fun there. We have a high potential program called Next New and Emerging Excellence and Talent. We have well being programs. We actually just brought in a speaker on menopause awareness um, just on Tuesday uh, for invited the whole company to do this, whether you're experiencing or uh, supporting someone who is or want just to learn for the future. Um, we have Slack interest groups such as Getty Dogs and Getty Cats, where you have to, you know, pay the tax and put a picture of your your pup or your kitten um, up there and also like reading or fitness channels or and that's you know no one's forced to do any of these things but they have options and they have opportunity for connection mentoring programs and mentoring programs that are resources for mentoring programs so people can kind of informally do their own thing and formally um, we have a mentoring program that actually is akin to um, leading into more like that, not necessarily sponsorship, but advocacy, advocacy of underrepresented employees. So we have a mentoring program called Amplified Mentoring Program, which pairs employees from underrepresented, um, often marginalized backgrounds, uh, historically marginalized, with senior leaders to break down barriers and give access to help, uh, help support kind of this next generation of leaders as well. Um, all the leadership development, performance development, professional development. I know many of you do those things as well. Global morale and team building, like the talent show we just had uh, the other day. And like Nicole also mentioned, those open forums. Um, and, and I mentioned in, in the chat here too, engagement survey questions as well. We do an engagement survey biannually. So we're doing a lot. It's varied. Um, we don't put all our eggs in one basket because that would be foolish. Uh, but what we do is we invest in a lot of different ways because people need investment in different ways. Um, and that is a lot around how we drive connectivity. But again, 
start at the beginning, start with definitions. And what does culture say, look like to you? You got to have a framework. Yeah. And I will say adding to that one thing is also putting, putting some of this on our employees. Like what does connection look to you? Because yeah. connection to me is different than what it is to Marie. Right. So what do you need and how are you going to engage? This isn't the business to or us as Getty Images saying, here's how all the ways to engage. We have lots of resources, but like, what do you actually need? So don't tell if you don't feel connected, right? Like come tell us what you need so then we can help support you through that. So that's, it's been a back and forth. And I think it's been a really good dialogue. Well, I want to thank Marie and Nicole so much for you guys taking the time to be here today to talk with us about the Your Flexible Work Program. I love this slide because I think it offers really tangible takeaways on ways to, you know, ways to stand up a, a successful, flexible program. So thank you guys so much for coming here. And I'm going to turn it over to Tom to wrap us up. Yeah, I also uh, want to give my thanks. Um, as I mentioned earlier with your principal slide, I'll say the same with this one. Um, great slides, uh, really provided a lot of extra context and detail. Um, the, the PDF of, of everything that you've seen today will be available at the recording archive uh, page at our, at our site. Uh, so anyone that was wondering about that, um, don't no, no worries on that front. Um, thank you, Marie. Thank you, Nicole. It's been a great conversation. You shared so much. Um, Getty is doing great, great work uh, across culture, across flexible and hybrid work. Um, I know, Marie, you mentioned at the outset how much you've benefited from it personally, being able to live in Arizona, the move from Seattle. Um, so uh, obviously, it's, it's a win-win for, for both the company. As you noted, the productivity has been up, uh, and, uh, and it's obviously a win for the employees. So thank you again. Um, just a couple quick reminders. Um, our culture, fitness, healthy habits of high performance organizations. Great new study that came out. You can download more information about that at our website and also view the recording of the session that our CEO, Kevin Oaks and Catherine did on February 16th. I highly encourage that. And then once again, one more time, lastly, our next practice is now conferences next week. Uh, you can still register, still join us in person in Scottsdale, Arizona, or maybe at this point more practically still register and join us virtually and attend all of the sessions that way. So thank you again. Thank you, Catherine, for being a wonderful co-host with me today. I want to wish everyone a great rest of your week, and we'll see you again on this call in two weeks, not next week, not next Thursday during our conference, but we'll be back again April 6th. So have a great week, everyone. Thank you.